Um, we'll begin with prayer. Uh, Brother Arthur, will you lead us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we're gathered here together again to lift up the name of Jesus and all that we say or do, we'll look into the word and let that word become part of us and instruct us and nourish us and strengthen us for the work ahead. We look to you for help and grace uh, in these prayer requests that have been mentioned. Uh, you know the ones that are, that are needing a touch, uh, the health and for upcoming uh, doctor visits and issues that are spoken and unspoken, Lord, we know that you're well able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask, all we can think. In fact, it's not even entered into the, uh, uh, our hearts of what you can do for each one of us. We pray your blessing upon the furtherance of this get-together that your uh, spirit will be upon our brother John and give him words to speak and that your spirit will be upon us that we might get the very words and the very message that you have for us this evening. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. We'll let sister Susan go first and unmute yourself and share part of your testimony. For what the Lord did for me when I was 14, that He saved me in a there in Murfreesboro, um, Illinois. And um, looking back, I we had a I have a Facebook friend that posted the other day that her aunt had passed away, a great aunt. And that great aunt I didn't even know was related to her, but she was the one that um, I used to I'd kind of pick me up for Sunday school a lot of times to go to the church that, that I went to as a as a child, but. It was during those times is when I started really realizing who God was and and um, and I did I believe I got saved a few times many times they had an altar call and many times I was the first one down there um, I'm thankful for those memories that I have and I'm thankful that when I was 14 the Lord saved me and um, he's kept me through a lot of different things that have gone on in my life and um, just you know the Lord lays things on your heart and here it's you know, 45 years later, almost that are about that when um, since I've been saved and I've been out here 21, almost 21 years and the Lord lays things on your heart. And um, it's been off and on throughout the last couple of years that I've thought about something, an incident that happened where I worked back in Fort Smith and um, I, the Lord would kind of check me on it and I, okay, well, I'll do it. And then it just seemed like nothing ever happened. And so finally, the other day, um, she popped up on one of the one I needed to talk to, uh, popped up on Facebook. And I, so I sent her a message and I just explained the situation and told her that I was, you know, I wanted to make sure that things were right. And um, she texted back and she said, well, Susan, that's just your heart that feels that way. And, and she says, you know, it was, it was, you were one of the, my favorite ones to work with when you worked there and all. And that wasn't what I was asking for, but you know, it made me feel good to know that I had taken care of it. And it was about about 30 days from the time I emailed her or messaged her until she messaged back. So I was just waiting to see what she would say. And I'm thankful that the Lord took care of that. And after all these years, you know, you just, things that just pop up that even now, I had never thought about it and, you know, except off and on, um, but the Lord took care of it. You know, I'm so thankful for that. It just kind of gives you a, a feeling of knowing that you're right with the Lord and knowing that everything is okay. And and I'm just thankful for all the Lord's done for me. He's blessed me with you know, my husband, my family, and a job, and uh, you know, things that I, I love. And I just um, have nothing but praise in my heart for the Lord. Amen. And Heidi. I thank the Lord for what he's done for me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm thankful that he saved me, first of all, um, when I was 15. And he made a real change in my heart. And I'm thankful that he has helped me um, and walked with me through every step of my life. And I was sitting here trying to think of, you know, what's new that I could testify about. And there's not a whole lot new, pretty much, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are pretty much all the same. But the Lord is with us through every walk of life in the last few months, especially. Um, Probably my favorite time of the day is in the morning. I go out in the living room and I just sit by our big window and I read the Bible and I talk to the Lord and he meets me there. 
and I'm thankful. I miss church. I miss all of you very much, but I'm so thankful that I can talk to the Lord and continue the relationship with him, even though we're not able to meet, and I'm looking forward to being able to meet soon. Um, but I'm so thankful that I can have an active relationship with the Lord, and he can, he can meet with me even when um, there's uncertainty in the future. If you look on the news, it doesn't take too long before it, it can be discouraging, but you can talk, when I read the Bible, I can get the proper perspective and the Lord helps like realign my thinking to know that he's in control and he always, he has a, a plan and he's in control and I'm thankful that I can turn to him whenever I need help. And I'll turn it back over to you. We will consider tonight Psalm 51. So let's turn to Psalm 51. And we will read the first 11 verses to begin with. To the chief musician, a Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desi desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. This is probably the most moving prayer song in the entire book of Psalms. It's stained, though, with adultery and murder. And uh, yet it's written uh, with a broken heart and with a desperate, genuine cry for mercy and for renewal or for cleansing. Uh, it records David's response after he was confronted by the prophet Nathan of his sin with 
uh, Bathsheba, a sin of adultery. But not just that, it was abuse of power. And as the king, he took advantage of her. Uh, he committed murder and he attempted to cover it up. This account can be read in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and in chapter 12 we read the prophets, well it's God's judgment pronounced through the prophet to David. But in Sam, 2 Samuel 11 we read that having committing, committed adultery with, uh, with Bathsheba, David arranged for her husband Uriah to, to be killed so he could take Bathsheba as his wife. And the Bible tells us that this displeased the Lord. And it's very valuable to remember that God sent the prophet to confront David. That would be what we would identify as Holy Ghost conviction in our day. God sent the prophet to confront and condemn David and to pronounce judgment on him. God brings David to this place of conviction, of confession, of brokenness and repentance before God, towards God. Uh, God brings him to the place where David humbly cries for mercy. He finds himself in this deep distress and finds no peace or comfort for his conscience and so that's kind of the context of the, the the psalm i might mention there's a variety of or types of psalms in the book of psalms there's psalms of praise to god as the creator as the king for his sovereign activity in in, in history and through the world there's uh, songs that praise him for his glory and for his works there's songs of thanksgiving there uh, for a specific deliverance or for a, sp a specific answer to prayer we see songs of zion uh, songs that, uh, songs or psalms that exalt mount zion or jerusalem the city of our god and the beautiful sanctuary that uh, uh, where god god's presence dwelt there are uh, royal psalms psalm 2 that we considered last week is a royal psalm that addresses uh, concerns of the king, and most, most often it's David or his sons as kings, but also that relationship of the king to Yahweh or to God, and that covenant that God made through uh, David's uh, dynasty or through, through his uh, lineage, the promise of a never-ending kingdom, so we see psalms that are royal. We see psalms that are considered festival songs that the worshipers sang on their way up to as they ascended to Jerusalem. There's wisdom songs, which may be either a praise or a prayer song that provide wisdom or instruction regarding the word of God. And then there are prayer songs. There are prayers uh, put to song, these psalms that pray for deliverance, for intercession. They may be songs of lament or complaint, but also they contain confidence and faith in God. So this psalm that we're considering today is a, we could say is a prayer song, but it's also a penitential, penitential uh, psalm or, or a repentance psalm. Um, psalms, we find that some of the psalms are prophetic, pointing forward to Christ or other things that were, would come to pass. They're historic, they're biographical, and as I mentioned, some are penitential. And this is one of those where captures a prayer or the prayer of a broken, of a contrite heart. Psalm 51 is a deeply moving prayer. The prayer of David, as he desperately cries to God for pardon and for cleansing, uh, after God convict, convicts them. Um, it displays deep sorrow. He confesses his grief and his broken heart before God. 
David makes no excuses in this psalm. No attempt to shift responsibility to anybody else. There's no scapegoat to take the fall. You Sometimes you see in an administration, some scandal comes out, news of a scandal comes out, and somebody has to take the fall. King David doesn't uh, blame it or shift blame on anybody else. We see in the psalm that he acknowledges his sin by, we see the words, my transgressions, my iniquity, my sin. In other words, we see David declaring, it's me that is guilty. He acknowledges his sin and he realizes that nothing, he can do nothing about it unless God provides the remedy. And that's a good place to be. So we see in this psalm, David's cry and grief for his, uh, over his sin and his need to be forgiven and renewed in, in, in God. And whenever there's a prayer of mercy to God, we know God, as the scripture often shows, God will be merciful and forgive. Um, those are some introductory thoughts. <laughs> um, I, might wanna, I might say that this psalm is not only relevant to the sinner or the one that needs to be saved. This psalm very much speaks to the Christian in, in several ways. One, it's instructive to the Christian that needs to be sanctified or have his heart uh, purified. Uh, the Christian that has been saved but has not dealt with that original sin or that carnality, the psalm is one example of several in the Old Testament that shows us the need to be sanctified. The psalm is also instructive to the Christian on how to pray effectively for the sinners. Instead of just praying with general prayers, Lord, save them. We can apply the, the lessons of what repentance and, and turning away from sin and, and, and recognizing the sinfulness of sin and, and responding in a way that, that finds relief and restores joy. In fact, if I was to put a title to, to this psalm or to this session tonight, it would be The Sinfulness of Sin and God's amazing remedy. We need to understand or be reminded of the sinfulness of sin. So that's instructive. This psalm is instructive in that sense to the Christian. We're reminded also not only how to pray, but how to be engaged in, in effective evangelism. Um, this is, in fact, this psalm is, an, uh, is a poetic expression uh, of how to, it's, it's David's poetic expression and his attempt to teach sinners the true path to conversion and to the remedy for sin. So we could jump ahead to verse 12, continue from where we left off, verse 12 through 17. Notice his prayer and the promise of what he would do once the Lord restores him and forgives him. He says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. And then will I teach transgressors the way and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Restore the joy unto me and then I will teach others. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud Thy righteousness. See, the thing with David and with everyone that falls back into sin, they lose their joy. There's no joy when, the, when, when sin enters back into life. So David prays, Rejoy, uh, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, uh, and then I will teach others. Deliver me from my blood guiltiness, O God, of my salvation, and then my Tongue shall sing aloud thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall forth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are of a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. 
O God, thou wilt not, not despise. So this psalm provides probably the clearest, not the only place in the Old Testament, but probably one of the clearest illustrations in the Old Testament of sin and its remedy. We see here both the, uh, we see the twofold uh, condition or nature of sin, both of transgressions or at, deeds of, of sin, commit, committed acts of sin against God. But uh, we also see that, and David understood the nature of sin or that carnal nature. So the Psalm shows us both the twofold nature of sin and also the twofold deliverance or the twofold cure for sin. The psalm teaches us and reminds us when we pray for others, show, uh, teaches us uh, through David's example what it really means to come before God with a contrite and with a broken heart. We dare not teach sinners that all they need to do is pray a cold prayer where they, quote, accept Christ as if Christ needs our acceptance, right? As if, if God needs our vote of confidence. It's, it's almost um, the approach maybe today, in some circles it could be almost to, to approach getting saved as with that, with that term, accepting Christ. And sometimes people will use that term, and they really mean coming to a real experience of salvation, being really converted. But it's not enough to just, more than accepting Christ, we want Christ to accept us. And that's what the Psalm shows us. David longs for God to accept him. We want to pray that God will bring people to a place of a, a brokenness for their sins, and that they will approach God like David did, humbly and in desperation, seeking to be accepted by God seeking to receive God's forgiveness through his loving kindness that is offered through the blood of Jesus. So we live in a society, and I, I, I know you, you're aware of this, that has done away or minimized the sinfulness of sin. It really seemed like there's little or no consciousness for sin. Um, if you look around us or read the news, there's no sense of guilt or no sense of shame for sin committed. Sin doesn't appear as sinful anymore. It's instead of using words like wickedness, people would rather refer to human weakness. Or, or instead of people committing adultery, today they just have affairs which is sanitized and mentions nothing about grieving and sinning against God. So we want to teach, we want to pray that sinners will come to a place that they will have a broken and a contrite heart before God. So we begin back to verse 1, David's prayer. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to, to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. In his distress for his own sins, he asks for mercy. There's no plea of his own merit. You don't hear him or see him saying, Lord, you know I'm the Lord's anointed. I'm the king. You chose me. I have some status. No, there's no claim to any status or any own merit. There's no blame. Lord, have mercy. You don't see the, the victim card played either. Lord, I'm a victim of my circumstances. This is a common one too. Today, and maybe not just today, but, but it's uh, somebody else is to blame. God, you put me in this position. I had too much time on my hands. You don't see David saying that. You know, I would have never been in this situation if, if, he, if you didn't 
place me here as if it's God's fault. We accept responsibility uh, for our own deeds, and David did clearly after he was confronted by the man of God. According to thy loving kindness, or according to your compassion, because of your mercy and grace, blot out my transgress transgressions, or wipe them out, erase them, erase my rebellion. Sin is rebellion against a holy God. Sin separates man from God. If you read, I believe it's Psalm 5 and 6, we won't turn to it, but, but David describes the nature of, of sin and, and, and how it affects God. And, and we see that, that God and sin do not mix. Sin will not stand in the presence of God. But not just sin. We see that sin and sinners are not separated unless they turn away, unless sinners turn away from their sins. In other, and we see this in Revelation too. God doesn't just throw away or cast lies into the lake of fire. He casts liars. Sin and sinners are tied together. And, and God abhors both sin and sinners. He loves this, the soul of the sinner, but those that rebel against God, he pleads with them and he's not willing to, that any would perish. But ultimately, those sinners will receive the consequences uh, for their sins, God's wrath and judgment. That's, you could read that in Psalm 5 and 6. So David understood that. And, and he asked God, deliver me, blot, blot out my transgressions. Deliver, in verse 14, he said, deliver me from blood guiltiness. He knew exactly this sin, uh, sin that was above all, that was right in front of his mind, couldn't get out of his mind, the sin that Nathan had confronted, of him, confronted him of, and um, he needs God to erase it. He pleads guilty. Have you ever heard of somebody pleading not guilty, even though they know they're guilty? Sure, too often. David says, I'm guilty. But he begs God or pleads with God that judgment against him would be erased. We all also must plead, if we, if we are not saved, then the sinner must plead guilty. I'm guilty. That's me. And I need to be justified. Only Jesus can justify the sinner. So he asked God to, to blot out my transgressions, to remove the record of his sins. Think about that. He committed some horrible sins against God, but all sin separates from God. And he asked God to blot them out, to erase them all, so that he could stand before God as, he, as if he had never sinned. He says, wash me, verse 2, thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Lord, I have admitted to the man of God, to the prophet, that I'm guilty. I acknowledge my transgressions, but my sin is ever before me. I cannot get this out of my mind. You see, David's grief and and, and, and the burden that he was consumed with. My sins are burned in, in, in my conscience. My sin is ever before me. I go to sleep and it's there. I wake up, it's there. God, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Wash him all away is the prayer. Cleanse me from my sin. Verse 8. And now make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Did you not catch that? He says his bones, and he's not talking about literally his bones, but the very core of his being is broken or crushed. And he says, you have broken. No, uh, uh, who, who committed the sins? David did. But yet now by through the instrument of Nathan, and the same way the Holy Spirit must come to a soul. We wonder sometimes, why will 
my son or daughter or my brother, my family member or neighbor, uh, why are they still holding out? Why are they not turning to the Lord? Maybe for one, we have to pray for Holy Ghost con con conviction, that the Holy Spirit will convict them and, and, and confront them like Nathan did to the point where they, they realize that this is, I've committed these transgressions, as we'll see with David here declaring, against a holy God. And he got to a point where he says that my bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. His, his, his soul was crushed. It's a blessed experience, isn't it? After the fact. To, to have your soul crushed because of your sins. We all had to come to that point. We almost, when people, and, and we pray that, you know, when people will come into church, they feel good and they, we, we want them to feel comfortable and to enjoy our church service. I'm talking about visitors or even any other one that comes to the doors. And we might be tempted to almost feel like, I hope they like it. I hope they like church. But the truth is that if they're going to be converted, they will be confronted with that their sins, not by the man, but by God. And this, yes, it was Nathan, but, but we're talking about the Holy Spirit convicting of sin to the point that the, the sinner feels crushed before God. And that, that is a blessed place to be because it leads to a cry like David cried, hide thy face from my sins and blot out my iniquities in verse 9. He was driven to cry desperately, have mercy on me. Blot these out. Wash my sins away lest I die. You get that burden coming from David. No, verse 4, he says, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. At the highest level, David's transgressions were violating the highest law, which was God's law. Sin, we know, often harms families, lives, marriages, homes, bodies, minds, and souls. Sin separates and alienates. So it does a lot of da damage to other human beings. And in this case, David did a lot of damage to other human beings. But he says, against thee and, uh, and thee only have I sinned. Which shows that above all, he was overwhelmed with the dreadful thought that his sins were committed primarily and mainly against a holy God. Not only that he did damage to and, and sin does damage to another human being or can. But most of all, for, for a sinner to come to a point of conversion, he must get to a point where he realizes, I have not only wronged my wife or my husband or my neighbor or my coworker, I have wronged God and I need his forgiveness. Against thee, David says, I have done this evil. You know what we don't read? Uh, well, we don't read a lot of things uh, about this account that David did, but one of them is David did not issue a public statement by his press secretary to say, in quotes, mistakes were made. <laughs> Have you ever heard that kind of a acknowledgement? Instead of saying, I have made mistakes, they don't, they, uh, they don't even own it, but rather mistakes were made. David doesn't say mistakes were made. He says, I have sinned. I have done this evil. I did this. It wasn't a minor infraction or oversight. I have done this evil in thy sight. Again, this, this psalm teaches us the sinfulness of sin. Sin is evil again, committed against God. And David understood this. 
And a truly repentant heart, heart will respond not only with sorrow for harming society or his fellow uh, human beings, but a, a contrite heart, a heart that is broken before God, is broken because that individual recognizes, I have broken God's heart. And a contrite heart, a heart that, that responds like David did, goes farther. Farther than recognizing I have hurt my family, for instance. I have prayed with individuals that seem to be praying for salvation. But as time proved out, they're mainly sorry that they got caught and they hurt their family. We want sinners. We pray that sinners will come to a point that they will realize, I have committed evil against God. And, and, and to have their soul crushed, not only because of the consequences that are coming from a mom or the government or or a spouse, if you will, but not and even more than just understanding that there's punishment, eternal punishment for my sins. But to, to get to a point that the sinner recognizes I have my heart is broken because God's heart is broken. And I have sinned more than anybody else, I have sinned against God, and I need him to forgive me in order to be back in fellowship with him. I have done this evil in thy sight, David says. You saw what I did, God. At some point earlier on, several times, David thought he could sweep this thing under the rug, right? Yes? He, he thought maybe we can bring Uriah home. And he did. And Uriah, being a man of God, didn't go home. When that didn't wor work out, he couldn't cover up the sin that way. Then he has Uriah murdered. Then he takes Bathsheba as his royal wife. And now, again, Perhaps he thought we can cover this up and nobody will know except me and Bathsheba. She's with a child and nobody will know. But yet God knew. So he says against thee have I done this evil, evil in thy sight. And he continues that whatever punishment I have coming, it is justified. That is true repentance. To get to a point like David, when he said in verse 4, uh, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, and thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and, and be clear when thou judgest. In other words, whatever you do to me, you are justified because I'm guilty. Too often people want to admit some wrong, but they don't want the full consequences for their sin. But, but true repentance, like David's, is one that says, I am guilty and I deserve God's wrath, but I plead for mercy. Your holy eyes were fixed on me. You saw it. You saw everything. There's no such thing as secret sins. Do you know that? Have you ever heard that term though? Secret sins? They may be secret from other men, other women, other people, but they're not secret from God. Recently, actually, I listened to a Christian um, counselor along with my family, and um, we were watching this presentation and this, this counselor this described a case of one individual that he was working with who was struggling with pornography. 
and and the patient revealed to to the counselor that the temptation was most intense when his wife and kids were not home and the and the counselor responded and he told them told this individual if you really believe that god is omnipresent and omniscient if you really believe that god is everywhere and that he knows everything then you will know that God is always with you and you're never alone. And David understood this after he was confronted that God had seen everything. David taught his son this. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. It's comforting to the righteous that he sees everything. And it's, it's wisdom to the sinner to recognize that God sees everything, to bring them to the place of true brokenness for their sins and true turning away to God. Many times people can blame it on something else, but deep inside there has to be a turning away because I am wronging and grieving God. So David transitions in verse 5 from his actions of sin to that underlying condition. David recognized that his behavior was rooted in a deeper condition. And we know in our circles, we, we're taught that sin is both a deed, but a David understood carnality, that we're all born with a carnal or sinful nature. So verse 5, he says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Here he speaks of the original sin, which all humanity is born with. We're all sinners by birth. Some, some people that want to do away with original sin will look at this verse and say that actually what this says is that David was conceived out of wedlock. But if you read the rest of the text, you see that he's, he addresses this condition, and, and then he also asks for cleansing, from de for deep purging or purity from, from this condition. But we'll see, but be, going beyond that, um, we can look at Psalm 58.3, if you want to turn to it, shows that David understood that we are sinners both by birth and by choice. It's a beautiful verse that illustrates the same truth. Psalm 58.3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. In other words, the, that we are estranged or alienated from God and His righteousness from birth. Their very natures are corrupt from birth, he says. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Or in other words, they go astray as soon from their childhood. They go astray to commit acts of sin as soon as they can understand moral right and wrong, and they choose wrong. David understood this, that we're estranged from God or alienated from God, we're from his righteousness from birth. So back to our Psalm uh, 51, verse 6. So verse 5, he says again, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. God desires truth or purity on the inside, on the, in the inner soul. In the hidden part, thou shalt know, know, make me to know wisdom. David had known wisdom. Job says, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. David had been given this wisdom or this truth before. It was hit in the, his hidden, in, a, in his inner soul, in that hidden part. He had a, a heart that loved truth, a holy heart. But he allowed his passions to overrule the truth in his heart and to defy God's law and to grieve 
and to quench the Spirit of God. So he, he recognizes that he was shapen in sin, born in sin. He has this condition, and he, he, he wants the solution. He cries for purity, for purging. He cries for cleansing, for deep cleansing, sanctification in other words. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Now he's referring back to his sins, but then again continues, create in me a clean heart. A clean heart and a renewed spirit speaks of purity, and, and we'll look at that. Renew a right spirit or a holy spirit within me, a holy dispensation or a right dispensation. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He prays and craves heart purity, purging. Cleanse me thoroughly, he prays, or completely, thoroughly, inside and out. Don't just clean the outside. Don't just deal with my transgressions. Remember, he says, I've acknowledged my transgressions. But he prays for cleansing, purging. To purge, the original word there, verse 7, has an intense meaning. It actually means to unsin or to purify from uncleanness. Purge me or unsin me. Purify me from uncleanness. Purge me. Sanctify me. Uh, hyssop was what they used, a, a, a bunch of, or a handful of hyssop dipped in blood was, uh, uh, dipped in the, uh, the blood of the Paschal Lamb was what the Israel, Israelites used to sprinkle on, on the doorpost. And it, it, it was a type, the, the blood was, uh, sprinkling of the blood with hyssop was a type of the blood of Christ. And he understood that I need to be purged with hyssop on the inside, he understood that there needed to be a blood sacrifice to produce uh, inner cleansing. In the New Testament, Hebrews 9, 22, we read that almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission or no forgiveness. And then 1 John 1, 7 tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. And the word sin there, singular, speaks of that condition of sin. So David, he prays in this section, create in me a clean heart or a pure heart. Holiness begins at salvation when we are delivered from our sins, but it's completed in sanctification where that old nature is, uh, the carnal nature is destroyed and we're restored to the pure moral image of God. He prays renew a right spirit within me or a a holy spirit within me a, a renew heart purity Reno, renew a right spirit a, a holy disposition within me as opposed to that carnal spirit uh, that he had in him now look at colossians 3 9 and 10 lie not this is colossians 3 9 and 10 Lie not one to another, speaking of deeds, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. The old man is that carnal man or carnality. Don't co continue to commit sins because you have put off that carnal man with his deeds. You have to deal with the carnal man to, to, uh, to be able to deliver from deeds that are sinful. So he says, you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So the old man is the carnal man. The new man is the holy or pure man or the sanctified man. So renewed, you'll see it in other places, not just in Psalm 51 and Colossians 3 here. But when he prays, renew a right spirit, he's asking that he would put on that new man or that, that, that would be renewed in the knowledge of the image of him that created him, or back to that moral image of God that created him. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Uphold me with thy free spirit, or 
Hold me. Give me that Holy Spirit and uphold me with it. He prays that the evils, the, the evil effects, sin has some consequences and effects. Sin robbed him of his joy and his gladness. So he prays, make me to hear joy and gladness. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Godly sorrow and Holy Ghost conviction brings a man to the place where he feels like his bones are, have been crushed by God, that his heart has been crushed before God. But God doesn't leave us there. He brings us to that place so we could cry for mercy and forgiveness. And, 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 and repent, uh, the repentance brings forgiveness, salvation. But then he, said, he pray, prays, hide thy face from my sins. Turn your face away from my sins. But he says, cast not away, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Remember, he had witnessed what happened to Saul. Because of his sin, God had removed the Holy Spirit from Saul. And, and David now, because of his own sins, sensed the Spirit of God being removed from him. And he says, do not remove, cast not thy Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not away from thy presence. I want, to, I want your Holy Spirit, your spirit of holiness or of truth. I want to live in your presence, not without it. So verse 14 through 19, David con con concludes his prayer with a promise that he would teach others. If God would forgive him and cleanse him, he would teach others so that they too could be converted. And he would praise God and offer him such sacrifices that are acceptable unto him. So, again, if we can have any takeaways, well, there's a lot, to me at least. But the prayer is, we learn from the psalm where we're reminded, Lord, save them. Break their hearts. So they can have real joy. Give it, get it to a point that they, they see their wrong before you. And bring it to the place, if they ever had been saved before, that they can, again, uh, they have that joy restored in them. God bless you for being here tonight and for taking time to consider the Word of God. Um, let's, let's conclude with prayer. Brother Cliff, will you unmute yourself? and? Conclude in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, uh, for the redemptive power of your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that Jesus shed that blood we heard about tonight, Lord. And we pray, Heavenly Father, each that's heard this and those who we're associated with will know the, the power of redemption. Heavenly Father, we pray also uh, for the ones that are looking your way for a touch from heaven, those that are going to have surgeries. Pray, uh, Lord, for all the, the needs of the body. We thank you, God, for what you've done for us to this point. We look forward to the day when we can get together uh, with the saints in your house. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you keep us until that day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.